and little robots that do funny things. And some of the things that we see at the top of the other line on this one uh, is sculpture, sculptures at work. Um, up there, that's, uh, that's volunteers who, who like to be tortured by Carl's uh, uh, things. And John Law is uh, he's been around uh, and, uh, and uh, protagonist of many, many uh, interesting uh, uh, things. That, that's his book, Tales of uh, the San Francisco Open Society, and tells the story from the suicide club uh, through uh, survival research labs, the Open Society, and eventually Burning Man, as he's today in Nevada. Um, and uh, then, in the next slide, so down there are some uh, pictures of Burning Man in the audience. And uh, the guy up there, uh, you probably recognize the jobs, you probably recognize the Bosnia, but every now and then you see these vintage black and white features, and there's another guy, long hair and uh, a beard, and that's this, uh, I mean, almost, almost the same face is up there. That's Daniel Kalki. He's the one who went to India with Steve Jobs, started the a song, but then something happened, and he didn't become part of that big billion dollar company. But it's ideal to bridge the two worlds, actually. <coughs> so, so to, to start the conversation, I tell you how I see it, okay? My, okay so, I, so who am I? My, my name is Piero, and uh, uh, I studied math science. And I started, then I got into the computer industry. was amazingly lucky. The first project I did in this country was not something that today is called internet. It was called something else back then. And, and so I, I, I grew up with the internet basically. At the beginning, I thought it, it was an incredibly stupid idea, but of course, this one of the many uh, times I was wrong. At the same time, I was, I was writing about rock music. Some people on the web know me more from my previous song. And, uh, and now I don't work in the computer industry anymore. And I, I, until last year, I used to say I specialize in writing books that nobody reads. Unfortunately, one of my books became a bestseller in China, so now they, 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 they screwed up my, my reputation. Um, the book that became a bestseller in China is The History of Silicon Valley, which I co-wrote with Harun Murao, who was the moderator of the panel of robots. So anyway, so given that background, I tell you how I see it. How I see it historically is that uh, there was World War II, and the Cold War created a big uh, military industrial establishment. That, that, that really wasn't there. It really changed the way the United States uh, is. And that big military industrial uh, environment, which still, still rules this country. Right? And, and a lot of us think we go to war sometimes just because there's this big push towards building more weapons than we used to them. And this big military industrial environment, what it did, uh, uh, it was funding research. I mean, to build better missiles, eventually you need, you know, scientists and engineers, and you have to give them money. So that caused an explosion, uh, an explosive growth through universities. Stanford was very small before uh, the Cold War funded all these new departments. So in Iraq, they were all children of the Cold War and a big military investment. And what that also meant is that universities needed by more students. The big universities, until the 50s, basically, were elite universities means that you could get in through family connections. But in the 50s, they started accepting everybody. So, by, so, so, so there was also an explosive growth in, uh, in, uh, in just college attendance. So by, by 1960, the, the data are on the laptop now. <coughs> by 1960, I think 38% of college age youth was in college. By 1965, it had passed 50%. So there was an exponential growth in the number of kids who were going to college. What that caused indirectly was the, creative, the creation of a new social class. Highly educated young people. That social class that never existed anywhere in the world. And what that social class started doing is interesting. 1964, Berkeley, to me, is the beginning of something. There was student demonstrations on campus. That, that caused the ripple. They ripple through shock waves throughout the world. I grew up in Europe when there were barricades in the street. You know, students protesting about all sorts of things, from smoking in the bathroom to the war in Vietnam. Okay? Indirectly, those protests were, were indirect consequence of the military industrial 
uh, and so, <clears throat> so this, this new social class, the highly educated young people, change the world. Go they change the lifestyle, right? over the years, of course, but change actually very rapidly in the late 60s, right? Change the lifestyle, change the way uh, academia works, so education, uh, went into the workforce, and in the Bay Area, which is really where it started, they went into high technology, because technology was also starting back then. And if you look at historical pictures of Zero Spark and uh, SRI International, the places where really the technology was invented, and Steve Jobs got rich selling it, but somebody else invented it. Those kids look exactly like the uh, kids of the counterculture in Berkeley and uh, San Francisco. So the way I see it is kind of funny. It started with a huge military investment that then trickled down, created uh, something, and that something actually ended up opposing <laughs> that military. So that's how I see it. Now, the, the big question is, do we have something similar today? And another, and another so that's one big question, okay? Can we experience that again? And you're, you're welcome to disagree with me with what I said, if, if my story on us is wrong. The second question, when I was talking with John Law at the cafe, at one point he mentioned in passing, well, in the late 70s, I think, San Francisco was transitioning from being a city of shipping to a city of banking, a simplified, and we had a lot of empty buildings. That's not a detail. Today, people like Carl are being kicked out of San Francisco because A, there are no empty buildings, and B, the, the existing buildings are you know, directly skyrocketing. Could something that, that footnote, uh, could that mean a lot in terms of what a new generation can do uh, that is different and original? I, I'm going to talk first. So, I'm, my name is Cal Selitich. And we are going to video of some of my work and a performance John and I did at Burning Man in 1996. Um, some footage of an organization called Survival Research Laboratories that John and I currently also work with. And uh, some footage of Matt Packard's uh, Machine Robot Orchestra. So that will just be some background imagery for us. So theatering around. Wow. So um, maybe that will be the audio. So um, how to answer Piero's broad question, um, which may be a bigger question is what is capitalism doing to the arts, and how do you do a workaround in a, when you're embedded in what I see as a broken system? And I mean, one approach I've always taken is that I always felt like an outcast anyway, and so, in a way, I didn't give a damn about a system I was born into, and especially a system I didn't appreciate or like. And that could be, you know, you can pick your enemies, right? The military, or academia, or big business, or the museums. And I think as you grow and change in your life, those enemies change and evolve. Um, but the, bigger question is how do you work around that system and survive as an artist and kind of keep your heart open and not get just squashed down. Um, so for instance, John helped start a festival, a radical festival that changed into something else over the years as systems of this John on zip line, crashing through the neon. That's a real 40 foot tower full of very flammable things. So that's a performance John I did. I'm not sure how to answer your question, Piero. There's plenty to rebel against. There's tons of oppression, maybe more than ever. There's income inequality that is worse ever. And it's the worst maybe ever in America. Um, yeah, but let me stop you right there. There's so much inequality now. How come I don't see millions of kids in the street protesting against it? In your case, what's the last time you went to a protest? When's the last time you went to one? Uh, 1970. I go all the time. And I've been going to protests since my sister took me to a Vietnam War protest. I was maybe eight or nine. And the cops are armed to the teeth. They have cameras on everyone. And they will beat the shit out of you. They will tear gas you. It is so violent and scary now to go to a protest. And you can't kind of get away with anything anymore because there's cameras everywhere. You used to be able to kind of lob some or do something pranky or weird, and now you can't. 
And protests are different. They're dressed in military garb, and they have tanks. And they will tear gas you in a blink. Anyone who went to any Occupy stuff, especially in Oakland, you, the cops instigated every single riot. It's Goon Squad. And so that's, I'm not sure that's going to happen on the streets without everyone showing up, like hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, I don't know. Well, 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 um, yeah. You said there are robots to, to protest now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I guess the question was, is that kind of uh, creative uh, um, crucible that the, the Bay Area has tended to be for so long, is that sort of happened again coming from, uh, uh, you know, from the from the arts, from the, from the underground arts, which is where my background is? Well, the Bay Area, to me, since I've shown up here in 1976, has been a place where people from all uh, other parts of the country and some parts of the world would come to because there was a collaborative spirit here. I don't know where it came from. It just happens. It, it was it was in the air, uh, as opposed to like New York or Los Angeles, where artists would go to be professionals uh, and to hone their craft or their art and and, and get good at it and make a living at it. San Francisco was was a place where people would come with the wackiest ideas you could imagine. I imagine some computer people were as well, and they would find people who would who would be interested in collaborating. Very collaborative atmosphere. And you could have a crazy idea <clears throat> and put it out there, and people would assist you with it <clears throat> without, without any thought, usually to uh, any career motives or money. Because one of the things that changed there is the amount of money that it costs to live here. When I first came here for many, many, many years, it wasn't that expensive to live here. You could, you could live under different circumstances and create stuff by finding stuff on the streets. Like you mentioned when we were discussing. Uh, how, how so much of the Bay Area was abandoned buildings back in the 70s and 80s. Well, this, this is a wonderland for artists accumulating materials to work with, including industrial artists like Survival Research Labs, which went on to uh, you know, inspire technologists all over the world, really, with uh, some of the stuff they're doing. They did the first uh, uh, controlled feed from across the world for a piece of art for the show that we did in, uh, in Tokyo in 1999, where people could operate these machines from Paris. Or, San Francisco or wherever. So uh, anyway, I don't know if that answers any of this stuff. I have no idea what the question was. But, uh, I, uh, I, I just want to thank Cal and John for changing my life with their work. And the Alco Tower in 1996, that was my first burning man. And it really changed my life. And John's last one. Yeah, that was my last one. I was done with that festival after that, and it changed in ways that uh, I have little interest in since then. But, you know, it's a great party still. I never thought of it as a party at all. I used to say I was a nerdy engineer, but Burning Man got me in touch with my artist. Okay, for those who don't know, for those who are younger generation, can you just summarize in 10 minutes how the Burning Man thing went from Suicide Club to Cacophony Society and so on? Yeah, there, uh, there's a huge amount of precedence and, and historical uh, you know, uh, stuff that occurred that fed into Burning Man becoming that. And it's also a parallel with, with many other cultural movements right now, including the whole social media flash mob thing, um, you know, street art to some degree. But it, and a lot of it started, I mean, Surrealism and the Dots had an influence on it, you know, situations to some degree, of American popular culture, uh, adventure fiction, uh, which were the things that influenced an earlier group called the Suicide Club, which is a group that the Cacophony Society came out of, which is a group that Burning Man grew out of. The Burning Man Festival and the, uh, the, the actual event on the desert came out of that came out of that group. And this stuff was also hugely influenced by something you mentioned earlier, which was the free school movement in 1960, the, the, the um, free speech movement in 19. Uh, 64 at UC uh, Berkeley that started and then also in turn inspired a thing which is very little known nowadays called the Free University Movement which was huge from the uh, mid 60s on through the late 70s. And the Free University Movement was this concept that people could, you could exchange the ideas and information for free. You know, what a, what a radical concept. Oh my God. A very difficult one in our culture to, to really, to really uh, work with. But that inspired the groups that I was involved in as a, as a teenager, and then later on, that Burning Man grew out of and where some of the rubric that still exists with Burning Man, that, that, uh, and some of which is still generally a, 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 a intention, but some of which is now a sales pitch for an event, 
came from a real spirit of uh, community and cooperation and freedom, the idea of doing something for free and exchanging ideas, information, and activities for free, helping other people do things for free. Very radical, still concept. Uh, just I want to say something about free. So, most art isn't sold. A lot of art is made to be sold. And so, in our scene in San Francisco, we hacked technology, made these weird machine robots, and this work, and virtually none of it has sold. So really, we did free work. We did our art for free, and, and even, why do you do that? Why would you work for free in your life? And you might think, or you could think of yourself, why did you do volunteer work? Or what do you care enough about in the planet that you would work for free? And so, if you have kids, you work for free for them, right? Or you'll sacrifice everything for them. But a lot of us, maybe didn't have kids, or had kids later in life, and so we had decades to work for free and live cheaply in a cheap environment in San Francisco in the warehouses out on the edge of town, and there's all this free, free hardware out there that you could acquire, and really it was, in a way, our form of volunteerism and gifting and giving away. If we wanted to make it, it was known, you go to LA or New York, if you wanted to do radical, weird work, you went to San Francisco. And sadly, that era is winding down, or maybe it started winding down during the first dot-com in, in the late 90s. But I thought, as a way for me to keep making this work, I'm not year 30 something of it, how do you keep gifting and just giving your work away? And so you create your own reward system which is a longer conversation. Uh, this is actually a really good point, because what I was about to say is that at the same time that you guys were doing these things, it's interesting what was happening in software. It's really, it's really good to study what, what went on in the high-tech world, how, how we got where we are. Until 1969, software was not sold. Software came with a machine. Typically, the, the, the machine was as big as this room, so there was no point in charging people for software. But you would buy an idea and make, right? An idea and make, right? would come with a lot of software. That's it. You, don't, you didn't go and buy a, a, a spreadsheet or a word process. Then, throughout the 70s, uh, IBM lost on some, some monopoly, whatever. But throughout the 70s, we still didn't have all these intellectual property laws on software. Software was widely available for free, and they were exchanging software, especially through the Unix um, uh, operating system community. Um, the, the PC story, and maybe Dan Kotkin knows more than me about this, but I, I, I tracked down eventually Bill Pence, who was, the, was probably the first one to use a microprocessor with a computer. Uh, he was a humble employee of the state of California. And, and, and then he showed me to Intel, initially Intel didn't know what to do with it, but you know, eventually other people had the same idea. And uh, his students wrote some software. He found this software later on in CPM, and that software eventually migrated even to DOS, Microsoft DOS, and so on. That's perfectly legal. It wasn't stealing. It was normal. It would, you would use somebody else's software to do something. And the Unix operating system here at Berkeley, ESD was called, you know, Bill Joy was working on it. Users could contribute new commands to their operating system, and they did gladly. And you would find that at the bottom a note saying, oh, well, this guy wrote this, uh, this command. So even in the software world, there was this kind of attitude. Um, I just, uh, I'm, so I came to California, I grew up in New York, and I came to California in 1976 to help my friend Steve Jobs with his little project in his garage and I didn't have any friends in California other than Steve and Steve was completely obsessed with his startup company so I was kind of lonely and the cacophony society was such a breath of fresh air I don't remember how I connected with it but uh, there would be periodic mimeographed mailers of events well the suicide club was the earlier iteration I missed the suicide club it was the cacophony society and I I don't even remember how I got hooked up with it. Uh, well, you weren't the only technologist that was involved with the crossover. I mean, John Gilmore, who started the Electronic Frontier Foundation, was a suicide club member, and then later a big contributor to Cacophony. Um, 
Um, Brewster Cayley uh, was uh, married, first marriage at Burning Man that I know of in 1993, I think. Um, there were other, other crossovers from technology. So I think there's a lot of uh, cross fertilization there for a while. Yeah. And I was a huge fan of survival research labs also. Right. Yeah, yeah. Eric, Paulus, uh, Eric Paulus at UC and uh, Ken Goldberg were SRL alumni. Right. And I think I met Greg Lay at a Tesla Society meeting, so that I was honored to be able to help Greg with his first huge Tesla coil at SRL. And those guys were kind of giving it away too, doing shows. Yeah. So that, that so comparing, you've seen the startup world when actually there were very few startups back in the seventies, and now you see today. I know you're still active. That's, you know, big difference, small difference, or just more people, more money, or, or something change in the spirit. I don't know. It's kind of wild how technology has. Uh, Evolved so fast. I thought I thought I would have a long, successful career designing computer stuff, and uh, it has just um, grown up and like a, a seed pod exploded around the world. And uh, the kind of work that I used to do that I thought I was so good at, I can't do anymore. Why? Because it gets sent overseas. Um, here in Silicon Valley, I feel like I have to become an entrepreneur to survive. But they were, like, the spirit of collaboration that they were talking about, which I totally agree with, right? it's, uh, first thing that struck me when I came to California was this different spirit of doing things. I come from Italy where the spirit is the genius. You want to be Leonardo, Michelangelo, you know, Galileo. So, so the, I totally agree. Do you see the same thing at the same time in, in the in the high tech world, 70s, early 80s? Uh, well, so when I showed up here, it was the Homebrew Computer Club, uh, which was very much a spirit of collaboration and uh, sharing. It was all sharing. Uh, and actually, I'll point out, so... Um, so, so my home, home Computer Club, for those who don't know, was the early uh, hobbyist building computer. These were not big companies. Yeah. And they were just demonstrating their... their Little computer to other people, and then some of these people went on to build uh, Apple and other companies. This year is the 40th anniversary of the PC, meaning the Altair, Altair on the inside. That was January of '75. I'm on the organizing committee for a 40th anniversary of the PC at the Computer History Museum on November 15th. And some of the members overlapped, right? Wasn't there somebody, um, now my memory fails me, somebody who was both at the Home Computer Club and the one of your Coffin Society or whatever? Um, I'm trying to, you mean someone who was yeah. involved in both? Somebody who actually, actually somebody who had started their own. Uh, yeah, it's quite possible. I mean, there are probably you know, somebody you know, over a thousand people involved in. Oh, yeah. San Francisco to you know, over the course of 15, 16 years, and probably a couple hundred in the suicide club earlier. I think a lot of these collectives were really our own forms of brain trusts and mutual aid societies. And there's all these artists and technologists and hackers and people trying to do a startup, and there was no money. And so when you're literally, you can't eat and barely pay your rent, literally, and you're like shoplifting food, did it a lot, dumpster dough for food, and, and uh, you, what was more important was to make this work and to make your art. And so you're like, how the hell are we going to do this? Well, I can't do it completely on my own yet, so you find, you start a collective, or you find a collective, and you work like with your own little brain trust, and you find someone who knew electronics, and someone else who knew about gear motors, someone who knew about engineering, and and then you could create these wonderful pieces that your dog could bark at and control. Um, that is an example. Okay. We did an event called Car Hunt in 1995, and I'm not a I'm not a machinist, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a technologist, I'm not a computer guy. I can build things, and I know a little bit about explosives. And uh, we, uh, Robert Burke and I came up with this idea to remote control a full-size 
uh, an automobile, so we bought a, a 1975 Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser station wagon. We didn't know how to, how to we didn't know how to do any of this stuff, but we knew people who knew how to do it. We contacted Chip Flynn, our associate with People Hater and SRL alumni, and Michael Fogarty, uh, some metal worker friends, Pepe Ozan, and we bought it, bought it station wagon. We made uh, steel wheels for it out of plate metal. Uh, Chip Flynn and his People Hater, that was the name of his group. Uh, remote controlled the uh, vehicle with servos that ran the steering, the uh, acceleration, the braking. We, uh, my friends, uh, Mike, Tim Schweiss and uh, Ben Vanessa made a family that we put, a nuclear family that we put inside the vehicle. We hunted it down with live ammunition from weapons uh, bearing grades, starting with smaller handguns and going up to armor piercing rounds from large caliber rifles on a small playa in the Nevada desert with a whole crew of about 35 people. We did it with no fucking money. I can't tell you how broke we were. Ridiculously broke. But everybody pitched in. We bought the car for $500. Everybody worked for free. And we, we, I've never heard of anybody doing this anywhere since then. We remote controlled the car and hunted it for two hours on the desert with shooting at it, filled full, completely full. The engine compartment was, we had a metal uh, baffles all the way around the engine compartment, uh, force-fed air through the, uh, through the uh, radiator, you know, so that it wouldn't stop. And uh, we did it with nothing. I, someone wanted us to do, wanted us to do that again. The guy contacted me and wanted us to do that again for money to be paid to do it. And so I thought, oh, this thing, whatever. So I costed it out. Talked to some friends of mine who work in Hollywood doing, uh, doing special effects stuff. I costed it out uh, comparable to what a Hollywood special effects company would do. And I came up with an incredibly low ball figure of what I thought was really reasonable, $250,000 to do this with a crew of 12 people craft services being fed, taken care of for two weeks on the desert, construction building up to doing that. And they said, no, sorry, thanks, no, nice talking to you. And Mark Pauling with SRL ran out of this problem all the time. People would contact him all the time wanting to uh, pay him to do his, these incredible machine shows. Uh, he requires that he direct and control all of his machine work and his crew be paid commensurate with that of a Hollywood special effects company. And no one will take him up on that. I mean, he's gotten offers from Rock band, major rock bands to open for them from Steve Wynn in uh, fucking uh, Las Vegas, and people say they don't want to pay for content. So we do it for we doing it for free. We could do it. We couldn't do it for money. Mic drop. <laughs> so I, I still want to go back to the technology side also. So uh, Cal doesn't know this. Um, one, uh, two or three years ago probably was a laser or something, you were there, and uh, I think it was the Arab Spring or something else was going on in the world, and people had, had started it with the uh, was your Occupy thing, and people would use smartphones and, and uh, you know, Twitter and whatever to do that. And I asked Carl, so he missed the context, and I just asked him, so what do you, what do you, what do you think of, the, of, of, this, uh, of this world of uh, Google and uh, Facebook kids? And I was implying the users. And he replied, they're destroying my city. So it's, it's interesting how, how different, you know, one can perceive a phenomenon from the outside, from very high in space. What you see is that this technology, which is actually the great, 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 great grandchild of, of the counterculture, in my opinion, that, that spirit eventually created it. And so from, from high on space, from, uh, you look down and you see, wow, you're changing the world in that way. But then if you come here, where it all started, what you're saying, that destroyed my city. And he was, of course, I think he was referring to the fact that the, the highly paid uh, engineers, I think he was San Francisco, he can have the artists, so the, the city's changed. Well, it took about 100 years to make San Francisco the most radical city in the world. And um, all these radicals flock there, the environmentalists, or people working with technology, um, every kind of artist, from filmmaker to poet to dancer to painter, and in so that took a hundred years to build that up, and in less than ten, they decimated it. And it's really not much different than what they did to the redwoods here on the coast. It took centuries for the redwoods to grow, and they cut it down in ten years, and you're not going to get it back when you. you when you're, you don't reflect on your actions like that, because let's face it, all those workers primarily worked in the South Bay, and Mountain View and Cupertino said you're not building the housing here. You can't, you're not going to triple the population of our cities. 
And then they just said, put your workers elsewhere. We're going to build the factories for these worker drones to sit at the computers all day. And, but we're not going to provide really the main, most important thing, homes for these workers. And so they dumped it on San Francisco because everyone knows all politics in San Francisco is, uh, revolves around real estate. And so the artists, the people on the low end of the, of the economic uh, pole, took the hit. And they trashed my city. My friends left, my family left. I'm the last guy from that ro our robot scene still working in San Francisco. And it sucks. That, that blows. And those people don't buy art. They don't support us. They're not even interested in this thing that happened that took 100 years that really we did sort of flip the planet on its ear. I can go on and on about this. And, and you know, and it pisses me off because I'm living this. This is my reality, and, and I'm still in San Francisco, and my neighborhood is trashed with yuppies. These are the people I moved to San Francisco to get away from. <laughs> And now they're like right outside my door every day. That's fucking you. And it's really not interesting what they're doing. I mean, capitalism is of no interest to me whatsoever. It's actually lame. I, I mean, you get what you invest in. But I love the garden metaphor I was hearing earlier, where you know, if you don't nurture a garden, if you don't compost, if you don't fertilize, then it's going to go fallow. And in America, and the arts, is the same thing. It's now going fallow because they're not nurturing it. They're not teaching art in schools. And so people don't understand what the hell's going on, and they don't understand the lineage and the arc of art history. It's, you know, they'll go in and look at a handshaking robot and go, what the hell is this? Communist plot. You know, because you don't, uh, you don't see any historical lineage. It's the same as if you walked into a physics room and you looked at the chalkboard, and I'm so glad so many physicists still use chalkboards, and, and then what the hell is this? You know, Satan's work? And if you, you, know, you can't discount something because you don't understand it or you don't have any education. Well, to, to slightly soften my dear friend's uh, uh, wonderful diatribe there, just a little bit, the technologists and engineers who, who are supplanting the uh, plastic artists, you know, in, in our area, in our town, have a, have, create things, and they're creative in a, in a certain way, but it's in a narrow field compared to this larger field of creativity that Cal just described. So, you know, having this supplanted in that fashion, just be aware, I mean, if you're in the, you know, clearly in this field of technology, that you have a great responsibility to be creative at this point in time, because what you're supplanting is very important and something that most people, I think, you know, in the engineering fields, younger people now don't really, like Cal described, don't really understand. You know, this is why the people came here because of the town that was made into the town that it was by people coming there and, you know, with no money to be creative for decades and decades. And that's what made this uh, incredibly fertile area, you know, the Bay Area, for, uh, you know, for technology to thrive. So, do something good with it. Well, and for the environment, you know, I can go on and on. You know, there's, there's people for a civil rights revolution was fought and, and is still being fought out in San Francisco, LBGT rights. I mean, it's not just the arts that got decimated by a bunch of yuppies taking over San Francisco. It's, it's a lot of other organizations and really goodwill organizations got kicked out of the city and the whole Bay Area. Really, for a bunch of money grubbing losers. I don't call it what it is. Creating uh, an app, there's a certain amount of uh, intelligence and, and, uh, and creative energy that would go into creating an app for helping someone to do their laundry, but you have to compare that to something, some more profound, you know, uh, spiritually or, or uh, emotionally compelling, you know, uh, creation that helps people you know, live in their world in a better way. I don't know how to put it. But, but, but I'm not anti-technology at all. Um, I, but that's something it. that is interesting, though. I, who, who are the people who are really eager to go to Burning Man now? Those kids. Of course. Those, those, those people are the ones who really line up to get the tickets to go to Burning Man. That's right. And the artists that have moved to Oakland because they can't live in San Francisco anymore are hired to create the artworks for those guys and gals. But you know, I can say, I think, I think that's not 
it's not entirely bad. They're young people. Maybe they didn't get art in school. Maybe they've been one-tracked by nervous parents who want them to be employable. Life is long. A lot of these people are gonna are hungry for culture. They're hungry for art. They don't know what they want yet. I don't think it's it's. I think this is a moment in time. I think there's a. It's gonna keep going. Burning Man may help a lot of these people find their way into art and culture. That's a great point, and in that respect, I do blame our society and our government for dropping the ball. And and so I can blame Cupertino or wherever these factories are down here for these workers for not building housing for them. And I can blame my society, my country that I was born in, for not educating people about art. You know, it's not, I'm an artist, I can't educate the whole planet. And, and then... So I would blame the corporations. I blame Apple for taking all their money and parking it in, where is it, is it in Ireland? They have like billions of dollars in Ireland because they won't pay their goddamn taxes? What a bunch of losers. Who needs a billion dollars? I don't even question who needs one billion dollars. You, you don't need that kind of money. And, and these people are economic terrorists. They're extracting billions of dollars from our country they, they got workers because we educated them in our public school system. And then they, they make all this money and they extract it and hide it away like, like robber barons. How dare them? That's, that's enough money to run a country and one company has it. I blame them. And, I, and in a way I don't blame these kids. They're going to have to be my children. You know, they're kids. And, and I, was, John and I were talking about that driving down here like, well, I was an asshole when I was 22. I'm, probably, I'm 54. I'm probably still an asshole. But, but uh, you know, I, I, I want to Can you tell us how you really feel for <laughs> I hope I'm a little more enlightened now than I was at 22. And, and I agree with you. You know, they're, they're just starting out in life. And so it is a series of steps to enlightenment. Or at least it's, I don't know. I don't know about enlightenment. Dan Spencer. Let's hear it then. So. Uh, interesting discussion. So now that he has moved over to uh, humans versus corporations, this is what you're really talking about. And that's what a lot of this art's about. Yeah. Mark Pauline would take uh, 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 corporate created uh, machine stuff from, you know, like a military based corporations and the military and repurpose it into art to show people, you know, the stuff we use. And uh, that's what I'll show. Scare the living shit out of you. As it should. As it should. See, and now let, let me play devil's advocate, knowing a lot of these young artists, they would have artists and, and, you know, hackers. They would reply, who cares about physical interaction? Who cares about physical community? Who cares about physical collaboration? We do that virtually in cyberspace. And actually, instead of having 200 people, my club has 20,000. Well, when the solar flares take all of that stuff away, we'll see what happens at that point in time. <laughs> all right, so anyway, what I was starting to say is the, uh, on, the, on the big theme of uh, humans versus corporations, that's a huge topic. Huge topic. It's not about technology at all, though. It's more about law. And uh, the really encouraging thing is the rise of B Corp, an official corp. Um, anyone knows that term? Um, and that started right here. Well, no, the B-Corp didn't really start here in Silicon Valley, but John Montgomery is the guy who's been promoting it here in Palo Alto. And the way he puts it is, um, he's a, a, a corporate lawyer, and he does incorporation papers for startups, and he said he's incorporated personally over a thousand startups, and he started to realize that he felt he had a responsibility to society to put in corporate charters the idea that you, uh, you know, there's a triple bottom line that it's not just about the shareholders, it's also about society at large, and it's also about the environment. So that's all very encouraging. Good. It was on this happy note. So we, so but to be fair to Stanford, which represents academia at its highest levels, it's five ten. We have the room until four. Nobody's kicking us out. We are displaying. These crazy machines on six screens. So, you know. You have six of these things. We would have swiped them. <laughs> <laughs> that's not like that. 
Don't as it was said, this is a pessimistic note at the end. This is a good time to be alive, and there's a lot more tools at your fingertips than they were, say, in 1979 when I started getting interested in doing this. And um, you know, people will regroup. Um, humans will outlive the robot, you know, invasion. Um, I will figure out the kill switch for the dark dog, and Ed will figure out the hack for the drones, and, and you know, it, hope springs eternal. And I wouldn't become an artist if I hadn't thought that we couldn't win on some level, and that making like extreme technology for completely useless applications for capitalism wasn't a way of winning. So every talk is a win, every show is a win, um, you know, I teach classes, every class is a win. And uh, you, you do your work, I think, I, uh, some of the, the reasons I do this work is to have a dialogue with the planet, to have an adventurous, amazing life. I've had a bunch of shows all over Europe, all over America, in India and Africa, and each time, I hope I'm you know, instilling radicalism for people that, to find their life purpose and to go on their journey, not my journey. You know, you know, one of the great quotes in this fantastic book you should get on the Cacophony Society is leave the world a little weirder. <laughs> and if you can do that with your life, you win. Great. Art wins. I love for weirdness. Uh, are we having dinner? Hey. Are we having dinner? Yeah. Yeah. So anybody who wants to join us for dinner is welcome. Wait, I have one more comment. So oh, yes. we're talking about technology. We've got a, the, the really exciting development that, that um, I don't know, I didn't foresee it at all, is the rise of the maker movement, yeah. which really started with O'Reilly Publications. Yeah, that's a good time. And Big the tech, what's that? Which publication? O'Reilly is what created Make Magazine, and they started the Maker Fair. And who suspected that it would just be so wildly successful? And uh, so the Arduino started in Italy, just independently of that. But who would have guessed that would become so wildly, wildly successful? So, and then the um, the Hacker Dojo, the Noise Bridge, the Tech Shop all of these uh, organizations, I just think it's tremendously exciting and uh, I like, I like good news for human beings.